We are in Acts chapter 2. Title of the study is The Day of Pentecost. And it will be covering Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 21, if we get that far. So let us have a word of prayer. Our Father God, we thank you so much for your holy Sabbath day, for inviting us to spend this day with you, to enter your rest, to enter your presence. And Father, as we have come into your presence to study your word, we pray that you will guide us through it. Fill us with your spirit. Give us wisdom and understanding. Help us to to get the message from this passage that it is that you want us to get. What you're hoping to get across to us today, Father, open our hearts and our minds to receive it. That through it, we might be drawn closer to you and be better able to work together with you for the salvation of others. We pray this in the holy name of Jesus. Amen. So again, we're in Acts chapter 2. And I'd like to start by reading verses 1 through 13. Do we have some volunteers to read this? Take turns reading it? Or if somebody wants to read the whole thing? And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly there was there came a sound from heaven as if rushing mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men, out of every nation under heaven. Now when it was this was noise mm -hmm. of noise aboard, the multitude came to gather and confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we were born? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers of Mesopotamia and in Judea and Cappadocia, in Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, in Egypt, and in the parts of Libya about Cyrene, and strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? Others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. Amen. Okay, hey, thank you, royal family. And I have to say, Taryn, I am really impressed with how you read all those names. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm glad it wasn't me reading them. <laughs> okay, so here we find, we, we start out the second chapter of Acts, and it says it was the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost was fully come. What is the day of Pentecost. It's the day when yes, the yes. disciples received the Holy Spirit and were able to speak in tongues. Okay. That's what we know it to be now, but at the time when they were assembled together, that's not what the day of Pentecost was. It's not what it had been. It's not why they were, it's not why the scriptures say it was the day of Pentecost. What what actually is the day of Pentecost? Do we know that? Okay, I will share with you what the day of Pentecost is. You recall with the feast days, 
that God had given to Israel. And the spring feast, we had the Passover, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the Wave Sheaf Offering all right there together. It was, I mean, the you, you, you literally had the Passover and the next day started the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And the, the very next day after Feast of Unleavened Bread started was the Wave Sheaf Offering. So all this became known as Passover or Feast of Unleavened Bread. It was two names for the same thing. Well, starting from the wave sheaf offering, they would count 50 days. The end of that 50 days, or when that 50 days arrived, is what God called the Feast of Weeks, and gave to Israel, said this is the Feast of Weeks. Well, the Feast of Weeks is Pentecost. Penta meaning five, like here in this country, we got the Pentagon, because it's a five-sided building. Penta means five. Pentecost was to mean 50 days. And so Pentecost was the celebration for the Feast of Weeks. And so that's what this was at this time, was the celebration of the Feast of Weeks. That's what this particular day is, the day of Pentecost. So we're here on the day of Pentecost, the celebration of the Feast of Weeks, which was the celebration of the harvest is what that was, the, the spring harvest. That's what Pentecost is or the Feast of Weeks. Now, where were the Jews at this time? And if you, if you follow the lesson, Faye's got the lesson popped up there on your screen if you follow that, you'll see we're going to cover the questions that are in there. But I'm not necessarily going to say question number one, question number two. I'm not going to do that. But we will follow these questions in order to, to cover this chapter and glean what it has in here. So for the, the day of Pentecost, where were the disciples? They were at a house all gathered in one place okay and how do we know they were at a house in verse two it says it thank you very much in the end of verse two well in verse two suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind and it filled all the house where they were sitting so we know they were gathered together in a house and where was this house at for instance all these men in Jerusalem. Okay, in Jerusalem. And how do we know it was in Jerusalem? Because that's where the Lord told him to go. That's where the Lord told him to go. If we look back at chapter 1, in verses 4 and 5, while they were assembled together, it says, and being assembled together with them, this is Jesus being with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which he, which saith he, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. And then in verse 12, we can see again that they were in Jerusalem. The, they had gone out to the Mount of Olives and they returned to Jerusalem. So that's where they were now. They were in Jerusalem. They were there because Jesus told them to go there and wait for the promise of the Holy Spirit, which would come from the Father. And so now here they were in this house in Jerusalem. We don't know anything more about where they were at than that. I don't know that it really matters, but they were waiting for the Holy Spirit to be given to them. Now in verse one, it tells us basically what their state of mind was at this time. What was the state of mind of the disciples? They were all in one accord. They were in one accord. Why do you think it's important that we're told this? 
I guess that's the way the being united, that is how the Holy Spirit would have really come to, to work in and through them for the Lord to reveal, you know, what, yeah. what was happening or what was about to happen. And okay. you know that God is not a God of confusion. So you can't have God being in a place where there is, I guess you'll say discord or disunity. Okay. And I, I would agree with what you're saying. Faye, somebody asked if you're able to, will you raise the lesson so they can see the next questions? Thank you. Let's think about this for a moment. Is what you're saying is correct and they did need to be in one accord for this purpose. Weren't they always in one accord? Why, why was it necessary to say this? Wasn't that always the case? No, they were not all in agreement because some of them wanted to have the first place and some thought they were better than others and they were uh, always uh, having some difficulty to understand each other and accept that they were the chosen and do the right thing. They were fighting for their own uh, position, maybe selfishness or whatever it is uh, in uh, search for power because we know how human beings are. They're not set with the mindset that Christ had to make them all his disciples and use them as he wishes. Okay, and yeah, and that's what I wanted to get at. You know, before Christ was crucified and raised from the dead, they were arguing all the time over who was going to be the greatest and, and even James and John, their mother, went to Christ and asked if they could be put on his right hand and his left hand. I mean, think about that for a moment. It's not just them doing it, but their mother even got involved into this. And so they had been in this dispute pretty much all the time when Christ was trying to teach them and minister to them. Now, after his resurrection, after he spent 40 days with them since he had risen, now he had ascended. Now, Scripture tells us that they've come into one accord. They, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that every single thing they agreed on in every way, but what it does mean is that they got along with each other, that for the most part, yes, they were in agreement. But even when they weren't in necessarily in agreement with something, they were still able to get along with each other and work with each other and submit to each other. They weren't trying to outdo each other. So they, they had the same goals and purposes at this time. So, yes, they were in one accord. Yes, Faye. Yeah, I, I think as we're looking at this lesson, I think it's really very important for us to really look at this lesson, to look at the mindset they had then. And why is this important to us now? Not just to know what happened in history, but what is in our future. You know, we are looking forward to the magnanimous outpouring, the overabundance of the outpouring of the Spirit of God in these last days. What manner of people are we all to be? You know, are we plagued with the same illness, spiritual sickness that the disciples of old were plagued with before the day of Pentecost? You know, they're back then, as you mentioned, they were striving who should be the greatest. You know, some, some ministries, there are ministries that are built upon, let me rip down other ministries to tell you why I'm the best ministry that you should be following. You know, there are some, you know, it's like, okay, there are some will not join and work with other ministry because you know what, if we join together, then you, I'm not going to do anything to elevate your ministry. And it's about self. Satan disguising himself to make it seem like it's about God. So when I think that John's and his brother's mother went and asked, can one sit on the right and one sit on the left? 
she might not look on it like, okay, I'm trying to exalt my son. It's like, it's, she's showing faith in believing that Jesus is the son of God and he is exalted. That's showing faith that, yes, you have a kingdom. And, but no, there was self that was woven in that. And we all need to examine ourselves. Am I displaying the love? Am I displaying the mind? What it took to get the apostles and the disciples to that place? when the lord saw it, that it was safe to pour his spirit on his people should we turn our prayer be lord teach me how to love teach me how to love because it's love that really binds people together it's love that can overlook differences that are insignificant you know we should be loving everybody no i'm not saying you have to join every ministry have to come that's you know there's ministries now that are lifting up satan outright going into school, doing all that. I'm not saying you embrace everything. We need to be bonded in truth, yes. But I think we need to get, by God's grace, a deeper understanding and experience of the love of God, the love for souls. The love, because last week as we studied, we re the, the, the scripture says, when the Holy Ghost is come upon you, you shall be witnesses. When the power comes, you shall be witnesses. So when the power comes in our day, the big outpouring, we will be witnesses. That's the goal. It's not so that I can raise the dead and speak six different languages and do all of that for my fantastic glory, but to finish this work so we could go home. Amen. And that's like Rob put in the chat, Paul and Peter did not agree on a few things but they were still in one accord in furthering the gospel. And Amen. we can be that way. That is the way we are to be. That's what Christ calls of us. And, you know, if you really want to think about it for a moment, how many of us agree with God on everything? I can pretty much guarantee you we don't. If you did agree with God on everything, there would be no sin in your life. So if there's any sin in your life, you have to admit that you don't agree with God on everything. It is a process of growing. It's a process of growing with God. It's a process of growing with each other. And the more we grow with God, the closer we'll grow to each other, the more that each of our, our understanding of things and our accord will come more into one with each other because both of us or each of us are coming more into tune with God and hopefully we will reach that point where we are in complete accord with one another and with God sin is a result of saying has God really said yeah it's basically doubting god what what did god say yeah it, it was right right at the beginning of this chapter luke the the author of it expresses to us that you know while the disciples were here there was no more contention as there had been in the past now they were in one accord as they were in this one accord what happened? What did they hear? They hear a mighty rushing wind from heaven, the sound that filled the, the house. Welcome, Sister Kaz. I didn't realize you were on. It's good to hear your voice. Thank you, um, Brother. Yeah, so, so they heard this mighty rushing wind, and I, I can only kind of imagine what that would sound like. I mean... You know, whether they had windows open and it sounded like the wind was just blowing through or, or quite what it would be like, but, you know, you're sitting there and who knows what they were really doing at the time. It just says they were there in one accord. They could have been praying. They could have been talking. They could have been sleeping. We don't know what they were doing at the time, but then they hear this sound and of course, this sound is going to grab your attention. And 
regardless of what's going on, then you're going to stop what you're doing to find out, you know, where's all this noise coming from? What is this? And where does scripture actually say the noise came from? From heaven. From heaven. And is it important to understand that? It is also important to understand that they were all given over to prayer. And we have been told in the spirit of prophecy that there are two events that cause them to be in one accord. Their testimony or their testifying of the crucifixion and their testifying of seeing Christ ascending to heaven. So that strengthened their faith. And that's where their hearts were humbled in which there were no 120 of them instead of 11. So having the 11, they were given over to prayer. They trust not to themselves to choose one to fit that position where Judas was. So they prayed to the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit chose Matthias. It was after choosing Matthias where the 120, including the mother of Christ, were given to total prayer. We have to remember the part about giving to prayer. They were in one accord, not just in, in their testimonies of Christ, but also in prayer as well. They were all praying for the same thing because that instruction not to move from Jerusalem until they were given the spirit of Christ. So that's where they were. And yes, you're right, Brother Rob. Yeah, and what you're saying about being in one accord in prayer, we find that in chapter 1, verse 14. It says they continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brethren. So even his family was was all involved in this. Now, that's what was going on. That's what we see there at this very particular moment, whether they were in prayer or not. Scripture doesn't tell us, but it still tells us they were in one accord. And so, yeah, they they hear this sound. They obviously knew it was from heaven. Scripture tells us that. Verse 2, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven. And so they knew it wasn't just the wind. They knew it wasn't a storm coming through. This was a sound from heaven. So this grabs their attention. And as this grabs their attention, it does tell us that this sound filled the whole house. And what did they see along with hearing this noise? Cloven tongues. They saw cloven tongues, like as of fire. Okay, they saw cloven tongues as of fire. And what did these tongues do? Make them speak different languages. Well, even quite before that point, just a little bit before that. It settled on each of them. Okay, it settled on each one of them. Why do you think it might have settled on each one? I mean, as we read through this chapter later, we find Peter is the spokesperson getting up, giving this sermon. But why not just settle on Peter? Why settle on each one? Because they were all chosen. Okay, because they were all chosen. Not just Peter chosen, all of them were chosen to show to, I think, God is not a respecter of persons. And what we do find is before Peter got up and gave this sermon, it does tell us that all of them were speaking, are not all these Galileans which speak, But then also what we see in verse 3 is set upon each of them. And verse 4, they were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so it wasn't just one person speaking, but it was the group of them. Now, and so they began to speak with other tongues. Brother Wob, let me add one word before you continue, if I may. Go the, ahead. The Holy Spirit came on them as fire. And we know that fire is the presence of God. And in, in, it's a way of purifying, cleansing. 
putting them all at the same level. So there were no difference between one or the other in front of God because the love of God was for each one and everyone the same because God is love. So when this fire came upon them, it was a, a way of purifying them so they were able to be sent to do the job that they were supposed to do. God take them and possess them to make them his own. All of them were God's disciple workers to go and do the work that was provided for them to do. So it's a great action that the Lord was doing by sending his fire upon them, his presence to be with them. I'm sorry, I wanted to add that. It, it, it was a great thing. I do want to say one thing with what I understood of you to say. You may not have actually said it, but what I understood. It, scripture doesn't tell us here that these tongues of fire were the Holy Spirit. What it tells us is there were tongues of fire that set upon them, and then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So it doesn't necessarily say the tongues of fire were the Holy Spirit, but that this is something that God used to help them to see. And, you know, it could just be so they understood something miraculous was happening. But when this happened, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. So we see that. Was what was taking place here, was it just for the, and we, we've we already read some of the story here, and we know it had an effect on the people, but before we get to those people, what was taking place, was it just for the people, or was this also for the disciples? Was it for them to understand something from it? And if so, what might that be? All right, Rob, as you're getting into that, I saw a question that Rob and Jen, Jean, uh, Jen, I'm um, putting the chat. If you think Judas the betrayer was still among them, would it have settled on him too? So I don't know if you want to answer that before or after. Would the cloven tongue of fire settle on Judas as well if he was there? Did I, could I attempt that one? I don't believe that it would have appeared to start with because they wouldn't have been in one accord. So it couldn't have appeared to, well, I believe that it couldn't have appeared to them because their being in one accord is what caused it to appear in the first place. Mm -hmm. Or if Judas had been there, he would have been in one accord with them. And therefore, yes, it would have. I mean, it would have so, had to um, have repented. Unless, yes. because look what yes. Peter did. Peter denied him. Peter, I mean, the denial that Peter denied him, as I say, it's a great denial. Yet he was there. You know, if Judas had repented, you know, but not in his, the state that he died in, if he was still in that state, absolutely not. And I'd like what you said. Taryn said something very important, though. What she said, if Judas was there, one, in the same state that he would have been, would the Spirit of God fall on anybody? You know what I'm saying? Because if one of the prerequisites is we need to be in one accord, would he have prevented that? And bring it down to our, a, our time. Am I the clog? why this spirit has not poured out yet am i is it me we need to ask ourselves as we're praying for the spirit to be poured out am i the one that's disagreeable you know what i'm saying so this very something good point about. yeah very good point brother um, before you move on one minute what is cloven tongue you know i did not actually look up the word cloven to be able to tell you that I can okay. look that up while Keith makes his comment. He's got his hand up. I had looked it up. Sorry, Brother Keith. One moment. I'll jump in for you. It means divided. So divided tongues. Okay. Like cloven hoofs. Right. And that was my first thought. I just hadn't looked it up to make sure. Okay. So the other minute, Sister Taryn, I love what you said. That That was so awesome. I got to put it in more context. Remember Acts 1, the Pentecost, uh, the uh, upper room prayer. 
happened in the context or happened after the Great Commission. So you remember that these events happen in a linear sequence. So they were asked to go to the uttermost parts of the world. They were asked this Great Commission to go and preach the gospel, but there's only 120 of them. So they had to ask for help. And this is not just any prayer that they were asking for in that upper room. There is probably a lot of soul searching. You know, there's pro Peter probably was like, remember me, guys, I'm not worthy to even be part of this group because I denied the Lord three times. And they were saying, no, he reinstated you. And I have a sense that these prayers that these, uh, these disciples were praying in that upper room was a kind of a prayer that the Holy Spirit goes, yeah, I want to answer that prayer. You better believe it. So it's not just any prayer. So the problem is we're not given any guidance, but you know that before they were given the Great Commission, they went into the upper room and then they came out, you know, Pentecost hit. So there has to be something in that transition in order for that homothumadon, which is one accord. Homothumadon in the Greek is basically the best way to explain it is when you look at an orchestral score, you have violin parts, you have trumpet parts, you have drum parts, you have the brass parts, you have the flute parts. Not everyone is playing at the same time. You know, the flute has their little part here, the strings have their part, the cello has their part, but at the end it comes to a nice crescendo and then it ends all together. That's what homothumidon is. So by no means is this uniformity, but more it's unity, where the right hand, the left hand, the right foot and the left foot come together to work cohesively to come together to finish the work. And yeah, thank you, Keith. And that, you know, that goes along with what uh, Paul writes later on about us all being one body. Now, the body parts don't, they're not the same parts. They don't do the same job, but they all work together. And so to, to go back to what Taryn said, that's why it's essential that they were all in one accord for the Holy Spirit to be poured out. And if the Holy Spirit's poured out without all being in one accord, then it looks like the Holy Spirit is being poured out on the one that's not walking with God too, and that can end up leading multitudes astray. Taryn answered that question, I thought, very well. And the only other thing was, if Judas had been there, then he would have had to been converted. Yes, Yolaine. Uh, would you please tell me how the Holy Spirit was presented to them? You're saying that because I said that it, the scriptures don't say that the cloven tongues were the Holy Spirit? No, I asked the question, just answer. We don't go back. I to know. I, I'm yeah. asking, is that what the question's coming from? Because I said that. No, no, no. Just give me an answer, because okay. uh, the scriptures doesn't say. The scripture doesn't say that the Holy Spirit looked like anything or any such thing. It says when the tongues came upon them, set upon each one, that they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah, what represented the Holy Spirit, because we know that God is fire. We know that God can be water. We know that God can be wind. He can come on any shape. So if we acknowledge the Bible, we have to understand that the Holy Spirit came on each one of them as a tongue of fire. As the Holy Spirit came on Christ in the water as a dove. So we knew that the dove represented the Spirit of God. And the same thing for this guy in that upper room in one accord because they were waiting for God to act upon them. The fire that came on them was, was the spirit of God. Okay. With the baptism, the scripture actually says that the Holy Spirit descended in the form of a dove. Here it doesn't say that the Holy Spirit was in the form of the cloves of cloven tongues of fire. It doesn't say that. That's all I'm saying. The spirit, the, the scriptures don't say that these tongues were the Holy Spirit. It says that they saw these tongues and it landed on them. Now, you can interpret that how you want to interpret it. I'm just saying what the scripture says and doesn't say. So 
if you want to say it the way you are, that's okay. Just realize the scriptures don't specifically say that. That's all, right. all I'm saying with it. So, Ralph, you're absolutely right. The scripture doesn't say that, but I want to read something from Acts of the Apostles. And if we're speaking to somebody who don't, if we're just talking Bible, this is what happened. And we see the cloven tongue, and then they were filled with the Spirit of God. Yes, it didn't say so. But for those who believe in spirit of prophecy, the curtain is drawn back a little bit. In Acts of the Apostles, page 39, it says, The Holy Spirit, assuming the form of tongues of fire, rested upon those assembled. This was an emblem of the gift then bestowed on the disciples, which enabled them to speak with fluency languages with which they had either been uh, unacquainted heretofore sorry which they had heretofore been unacquainted the appearance of fire signified the fervent zeal which which the apostles would labor and the power that would attend their work so yes the scripture didn't say this was that but spirit of prophecy kind of pulled the curtain back a little bit for those who want to believe the spirit of prophecy. Okay, thank you. So I would assume, Yolaine, that answers your question. And the, the thing is that we want to be uh, clear and understand because we also will be receiving the spirit of God. So we don't know how it will come upon us. So we have to be prepared and connected with the with Christ, so when we are receiving the Spirit, we we will feel the power of that Spirit in us, and to know what we have received, because the, the Spirit will come in any shape and way, as soon as we are ready to understand the power of God in us. That that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, and we can receive all uh, without ever my, seeing anything. So, my so brother, go ahead. Happy Sabbath, first of all, to everybody. There is something important I also read in the Spirit of Prophecy concerning this. When the dove came down on in the baptism, it was an emblem as well. And now the tongues are the emblem as well. Now, the dove was the emblem of the meekness of Christ, because be meek like a dove. And the tongues they were the emblem of the multi languages that the, those disciples are going to zealously spread the, the gospel in a very fervent zeal. So this fire was an emblem of the, these fire tongues were the emblem of fire that the disciples are going to evangelize uh, with that wonderful zeal. This is what I wanted to say. Okay, thank you. And yeah, there, there's no doubt, I, I think no doubt, that's exactly why it came down in the form of tongues, why this was the emblem that, that God used. And the fire too, as Jolene had said, you know, fire is God, one way that God cleanses us and it is a, a cleansing work must take place in us in order for God to be able to use us and to pour the Holy Spirit upon us. And so, you know, this is a very fitting symbol. Okay, before I go on, go ahead, Faye. I just read something in Acts of the Apostles, page 36 and 37. It is just so beautiful. I want, if you would allow me to just share it a little bit. And why I want to share it again, as we are looking at what happened then, and preparing for what we want to experience, it's really good to really dive into what it was like. Thank you, Niz, for sharing that and what all that you, you have all shared before. It says, as the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, like we are waiting for the fulfillment of this promise. We are promised, right? Look what they did. As the disciples waited for the fulfillment of the promise, they humbled their hearts in true repentance and confessed their unbelief. I'm going to read some more. And as I read about what they did, let's think about what we need to do through the power of Christ. 
they reproach themselves for their misapprehension of the Savior. Like a profession, scene after scene of his wonderful life passed before them. As they meditated upon his pure, that's Christ's pure, holy life, they felt that no toil would be too hard, no sacrifice too great. If only they could hear, bear witness in their lives to the loveliness of Christ's character. I mean, it's like, remember now, when the power comes on you, you're going to be witness. And this is their desire. It's saying, are we saying that today? There's nothing too hard for me to take off. There's nothing too great. I just want to be a witness for my, my Lord. Oh, if they could but have the past three years to live over, they thought, how differently would they have act? If they could only see their master again, how earnestly would they strive to show him how deeply they loved him and how sincerely their sorrow for having ever grieved him by a word or an act of unbelief. Putting away all differences, all desire for supremacy, they came close together in Christian fellowship. They drew nearer and nearer to God. And as they did this, they realized what a privilege it had been in their theirs in being permitted to associate so closely with Christ. Sadness filled their hearts as they thought of how many times they had grieved him by their slowness of comprehension, their failure to understand the lessons that for their good he was trying to teach them. These days of preparation were days of deep heart searching. The disciples felt their spiritual need and cried to the Lord for his holy unction that was to fit them for the work of soul saving. They did not ask for blessings for themselves merely. They were weighted with the burden of salvation of souls. They realized that the gospel was to be carried to the world and they claimed the power that Christ had promised. Again, that's Acts of the Apostle, pages 36 and 37. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Faye. Thank you. And, you know, the fact that they were told to wait in Jerusalem until the promise of the Holy Spirit came upon them but they weren't told how this was going to happen. They weren't told how they would know that this took place. And so here having it both audible, a noise that they recognize being from heaven, and then also visible, left it so there was no doubt. And the change that it produced in them, or the work that it produced in them, left it as no doubt that's exactly what this was the holy spirit being poured out on them and the fact that it was poured out on them as a group and not just one or two of them showed the how god wants to work with all of us he doesn't just choose one or two and say you know the rest of you are just little minions to serve them no, God wants all of us working together with him. And, you know, that's if those of us that think we have no gift. You do. We all do. Scripture tells us that plainly. And if we say, I don't have any gift, that's to deny God at his word. If you don't think you have one, instead of claiming you don't have one, ask God to show you what it is. And so now, when they began to speak, was this actual earthly languages that were spoken? Or is this something like Paul writes somewhere later, if I speak with tongues of angels, was this tongues of angels that they were using? Is this some language that nobody knows was this earthly languages they were speaking what was it and how do we know what it was it had to be languages of the earth because it had to be languages that people understood 
And did the people understand it? Yes. And we know that how. I mean, we can say that, but do we have proof people understood it? Yes. We Let's try it. to find it. Yeah. Hold on. We see it in from verses six to eight. Amen. And this was noise abroad. The multitude came together. And were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how we how hear we every man in our own tongue, wherein we no, were born. Okay. Thank you. And so scripture makes it very plain here that this is earthly languages. It is languages that people understood. And it uses, you know, in the King James, we have both the word language and the word tongue used. Many people today take the word tongue and use it as if it's something that, you know, we can't understand this any. We just have to accept it as the Holy Spirit being poured out on us. But the truth is, when the Holy Spirit was poured out here, yes, they spoke in other languages, but they spoke in earthly languages that people could understand. It wasn't just some sort of gibberish somewhere, or and I, I shouldn't really use the word gibberish, but it wasn't just some speaking that no one knew, but that it was something that people around could actually understand. It wasn't, they, they weren't speaking in a language that somebody over in, in Kenya somewhere knew, but nobody around them knew. Or it wasn't like they were speaking Russian and had no Russians there. We have a list of a number of different countries. There, there was, I think, 15 of them that I, I counted, something like that that they heard in all these different languages. Royals, go ahead. Yes, yes, Brother Robert, I have a question for you. So, like on YouTube or social media, you know, when I see these pastors or preachers, you know, talking in gibberish, you know, what they call tongues, what is that? Rob said he doesn't want to use the word gibberish because what is gibberish to you may make sense to somebody else. So when we hear these pastors talking in songs and what sounds like un, un, under, songs that cannot be understood, Bible mean talk, like talking with, with you can't understood, and not even the people themselves who are speaking it don't understand it. You know, what is that? Before you say that, I want to share a, a little story about somebody who said this was this actually happened. Because sometimes there is a preacher that calls himself the Holy Ghost bartender. He, he serves out the Holy Ghost, man. And he serves it out. And people are able to speak in languages that they themselves don't understand. And nobody around them don't understand. And I want to say languages because there was a... As this pastor told this story of that was ha happening in a particular church and there was a Chinese somebody from China who spoke Chinese language this was in Jamaica we have a lot of Chinese and stuff there persons there and the person chased out of the church because he heard the people cursing God in, in, their, in his language. I'm saying that these unknown tongues, as they call them, unknown tongues, let's call it, that's not known to the person who is speaking it. And that's not known to anybody who is listening can be dangerous because people have heard these unknown tongues who know what they're saying and they're actually cursing God while they feel like they're talking to God because another power has taken them over. And I want to say some more things, but I think Keith hand was up and Yelaine, so I'll allow them to go first. 
Unless you wanted to answer first, Rob, you were talking first. Uh, go ahead, Yolene. Okay, I can uh, testify to this because when I came to Florida, I was a uh, seven days Adventist. I used to go to the Pentecostal church uh, about 15 minutes away from my home. And one day I was invited to a seminar or a conference, whatever it was. And the purpose was to teach people how to speak in tongue. But I was always amazed to, to not, I wouldn't say amazed, but not in my skin to understand how they were telling you to prepare yourself to speak in tongues. They told you to empty your mind of everything and let the power come to you. I said, what kind of power is coming to me so I can speak another tongue that I don't know? And uh, when they, start, they said, open your mouth and let your tongue roll. That was amazing to me. I stood up and I left that place. And I never put my feet back in this church because I didn't feel in my skin to be able to let anything come into me to make me do anything I didn't want to do. So when they tell you to come and learn those tongues, it's not the spirit of God speaking it in you because God will let you know when he needs you to be used to express his message. And we have to know which God we serve because the devil can possess you and take over your body and your mind and make you do the things that you don't want to do. We have known about this already. So that's what I wanted to see. Yeah, I've never seen in scripture where God wants us to empty our minds. He wants us to have our minds transformed, have a renewing of the mind, a changing of the mind, but never an emptying of the mind. And if it is the Holy Spirit being poured out upon us, why do we need to teach somebody how to do this? If this is the result of the Spirit, then the Spirit should be the one teaching it, not you and I teaching it or whoever. Go ahead, Keith. Oh, okay. I can go? Yes. So that's called pseudolalia. If you go into the chat, I put an ABC News video where they do something called functional MRI. What functional MRI does, it shows you what parts of the brain are being activated whenever you do something. So what they do is they give a radio tracer called a glucose uh, and it's radio labeled. So you can see where the glucose gets uptaken and it's actually used. And when you normally speak, most everyone has their language center on the left side of their brain. So when we normally speak, the left part of the brain lights up on a functional MRI. They actually show you the footage of this when you watch the video. Then what they did is they got somebody who claims to speak in tongues. And so what they did is they had him speak normally, left side of the brain lit up. Then they had him speak in tongues. Guess what portion of his brain lit up? The right side. So now the logical question is, what does the right side of the brain do? The right side of the brain is necessary for creativity, for making stuff up. So from a scientific perspective, pseudolalia or hamina, hamina, that's you just making stuff up. That is not actually language speak like was spoken in Acts chapter two. In Acts chapter two, the Bible says that these people, which were from all over the then Roman world, came together for their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, heard the language where they are accustomed to, and so they heard the gospel heard in their own tongue. So the left part of the brain was actually active. How fishermen and common folk of Jerusalem or, or, or the, his, Jesus' disciples learn how to speak all those different languages? I don't know. But I, all I'm saying is the Holy Spirit can do things to the brain that we can't even begin to understand. Acts 2 is evidence of that. Okay, thank you, Keith. Okay. So I thank Keith for giving the scientific explanation. There was one other thing that Keith said. In that case, that man was making it up. And some people make up the sound. 
But I tell you, some people do not make up the sound. It's not something they are making. When they are teaching you, and I know the steps to be taught. I wasn't taught myself, but I know a few people that were taught. And my sister was being taught. And, of course, as Sister Elaine said, they told her, empty your mind. And they tell her to say over and over, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. They tell you to repeat one thing over and over. And no matter what, because she kept praying and she could not. Because in that church, they believe the evidence of having the Holy Spirit is to be able to speak in tongues. And I encourage people who are watching this, go to Exposing Truth Ministry YouTube and look at the video that says, do I need to speak in tongues to be saved or something of the sort. You know, it's, it's tongue, speaking in tongue and evidence that I have the Holy Spirit, something of that nature. So there is a part of it that they tell you how to do it. But I also tell you, there is a different power that comes on that recipient who has opened their minds to another power and they lose control. Part of it is hypnosis. You know, I was watching that same Holy Ghost bartender as he was talking to a big audience and they were going down and touching people to speak to the spirit. And people, there were people who were not getting it, you know, because they have the holy laughter and sometimes they bark like a dog. They jump on cheers. And this is a movement of the Holy Spirit now. He actually said, we have it on recording. This was from years ago, not when now they do all kind of mess up things with video. He says, those of you praying, stop praying. He says, stop praying. You should have prayed before you got here. There is a reason. And there was a reason why my sister wasn't getting it. Because she was praying to God to ask her to give her his spirit. And that's not how it's demonstrated. So, a lot of these people, some fake it. I had a friend in school. She was in my primary school. She actually said they would take toothpaste to church. Because there's a frotting that goes with it too. You know, and there are people who fake it, but there are people who get so caught up that they become possessed, not by the spirit of God, by another spirit. And they are saying things and doing things that's unexplicable. But people tend to believe that's the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not manifest itself in that way. So, yes, there are some people who make it up. There are some people who just take it over. And control. I think it was Sister Kaz and then Sister Yelene. Can I say something? All right. Okay. Sister Niz is not able to hold on. Are you able to say it after Sister Yelene, Sister Niz? Yes. All right. So we have Sister Kaz, Sister Yelene, and then Sister Niz. Sister Kaz. Okay. So I've been listening to the discussion, and what one of the things I've learned to understand is that in everything that God has there's a counterfeit there is a demonic counterfeit from satan and we're we're on the subject of tongues and i believe that this thing about tongues has been counterfeited so persons may be gibberish and i do call that gibberish because sometimes they themselves are most of the times they do not understand what they are actually saying but we have been told that in the i mean in the book the acts of the apostles we have been told that they were all filled with the holy spirit and they began to speak with other tongues has the spirit gave them utterance has the spirit of god gave them utterance and the holy spirit and you know the word cloven came up in our discussion cloven and while I understand that the word cloven means divided or split, what came to my mind is the scripture in Numbers. I think it is in Numbers where we are being told that God, as Moses asked God, how do you expect me to lead such a massive multitude of people? I cannot do this. And God decided to help Moses. And so what he did was took off the spirit that was on Moses and placed it upon 70 more elders. So the spirit is now divided. And that's what the word cloven means. And as we're on the subject of tongues, we have been told that they were dwelling at Jerusalem at the time, devout men out of every nation under heaven, every nation 
under heaven. And during that time, the Jews had been scattered to almost every parts of the inhabited world. And in their excitement, they had learned to speak various languages. Now, this is these, these are Jews I'm telling you about who were scattered about all across the globe. And what they would do is many of these Jews were on this occasion would journey to Jerusalem and they would attend the religious festivals that would be in progress. And every known tongue was represented by those assembled. And this diversity of tongues or languages would have been a great hindrance, the proclamation of the gospel. But God in his miraculous manner supplied the deficiency to the apostles wherein the other Jews who have journeyed to Jerusalem would have heard them speaking in the very tongues that they would have, while they were scattered, would have learned. We have been told that this work the Holy Spirit did for them, something marvelous that in ages and in all of history, the apostles could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. But this gift was for the proclamation of the truth of the gospel abroad. And they were speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. And it was a miraculous gift. Let me say this. Talking about tongues, I understand what you guys are saying about tongues. And I am, um, I've had this discussion with somebody some time ago or a church who they deem Seventh Day Church of Christ, something like that, but they do speak in tongues. And it is when I read the book of the apostles that I understood what the Bible said about tongues. And that is why sometimes, as Faye had said, sometimes the curtain had to be pulled back in the spirit of prophecy. And that's what God did so that we could understand many of the Bibles and, sorry, many of the Bible truth. And therefore, we have been told that even though the spirit of prophecy is a lesser light that leads to the greater light, Without some of these truths, we probably would have accepted deceptions from these so-called pastors where how they're teaching about uh, when people speak in unknown tongues, they're speaking to God and they're not speaking to men. And so that's my little piece. Yeah, I wanted to add, we can take as example those people who go for yoga. Yoga is a practice of God's word. They go and make the people empty themselves and tell them to say things that they don't know what they are saying and they are going, thinking that they are receiving power, they are doing this, they are doing that, when it's not God's purpose for them to practice yoga because it, it is a defendant for Christians to go and ab abide themselves in the yoga exercise to, to think that they're getting stronger or whatever it is. That's all I wanted to say. Sister Ness, go ahead. Uh, well, I heard a story of an old... Uh, someone spoke about an old lady who had that pastor talking in the church and he was speaking her language that is a foreign language from the people around her and then suddenly she took her shoes off and she hit him with her shoes and then they were like what happened and then she said this man is cursing in my language so as Sister Faye said in the beginning, there could be some possession using these languages. This is not something, it, it could be very risky. Yeah, and the people doing it, to, to go back to the question that Brother Royal asked to start with, you know, where are these words coming from? Not being able to speak the language, I can't say, you know, whether it's a language or not. I know years ago, I went to church with my brother, and he was attending a Pentecostal church. And I wanted to talk to somebody about speaking in tongues, find out about it. And he says, talk to my Sunday school teacher. So after class was over, I talked to the Sunday school teacher. And I started asking him questions and he's like, I can't answer your questions. I don't know. I don't know. 
you you need to talk to the pastor. And of course, my first thought, I was a pretty new Christian, but my first thought was, if you can't un answer the basic questions dealing with your beliefs, why are you even a teacher? But I said, okay. And that evening I had an opportunity to talk with the pastor. And so I'm talking to the pastor about Acts chapter two and what's going on here and what they do. And what it came down to with the pastor is one of them, one, one of the things was interpretation of tongues. The other was a translation of tongues. So that was the difference between chapter two and what they were doing. And I couldn't answer anything. I couldn't go any further. Okay, so the difference is between translation and interpretation. So, um, of course, what I did, and this was before cell phones to be able to look things up on the cell phone real quick. So first thing I did when I got home was pulled out a dictionary and looked at interpretation and translation, and they're synonyms of each other. And they mean the same thing. And so what he was saying is this and this is different because one's interpretation and one's translation. If that's what he still holds to, he, he's completely wrong because they're the same thing. So since the one, we're very plainly told what it is, that it is languages, the other has to be wrong. Now, if something is not if it does not go along with the scriptures, if it is not according to the truth that God gave us, then all I can say with it is it has to be from the devil. And for anybody that's listening to this and that just upsets you, I'm sorry. But the thing is, regardless of what it is in our life, if it's not of God, it's of the devil. And we have to make sure everything is of God. And when we look at this chapter here, this chapter tells us clearly that these tongues were other languages that people of this earth understood. It was their native tongues. It wasn't just something that, oh, God's given me the ability to understand this, even though it's not a real language. No. It's the languages, Scripture said in verse 6, their own language. Another verse we saw, what was it, verse 8? The, the tongue in which we were born. So it's not something that they learned somewhere along the lines. It's, it's not like, it, it, I know growing up, my brother and sister spoke what they called pig Latin, which is something that people take the language and they somehow reverse letters in the words and say things. Okay, that's a made-up thing. It's not a real language. It's something that they made up, changing words a little bit. That's not what this is. These were actual languages. And Sister Kaz, I want to thank you for bringing out the points that you made that these people were devout Jews. Scripture tells us that, who had come from all over the world. And the purpose is going back to the fact that it's the day of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost, or the Feast of Weeks, was one of the three festivals every year that God said all the men of Jerusalem, or all, all the men of, of Judah, all, all Israelites, were to come to Jerusalem for that feast. And that is why there were these people, as is said in, what was it, verse 5, out of every nation under heaven. There were Jews scattered everywhere, but they were here now because it was a celebration of the Feast of Weeks, one of the three festivals that they were all to come to Jerusalem. And so now here it was, we see in verse 11, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. Now, when people are speaking these other tongues that they call them, Nobody knows what they're saying, 
unless like a couple of these stories were, there was somebody there that actually knew the language they're speaking. And they've said, you know, they're cussing God or they're just saying cuss words, whatever. You know, what was happening here with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, it's not going to be that type of thing, but it is going to be for the proclamation of the gospel to help people to understand the truth of God, who he is, what he has done, is doing, has promised to do, what it means for us. That's what this is all about. And, you know, Faye brought in earlier about the Holy Spirit being poured on us. When the Holy Spirit is poured on us, it will be for the same purposes. So if we can understand, you know, this section of, of Acts chapter 2 and what was actually going on here and why, then that helps us to much better understand what the manifestation of tongues really is about, why God gave it. And God gave it so everybody would know what had taken place, the life of Christ, the death of Christ for our sins, his resurrection showing power over death, the power of sin and the penalty of sin, and then also his ascension to heaven, because they had just witnessed that 10 days earlier, seeing him rise up to heaven and being promised that he was going to return. And when we see, as we go on through chapter two, we'll see that that's what Peter is telling these people. That's what it is, is they're sharing the wonderful works of God. That's what the, the speaking in tongues is all about. That's what it's for. If that's not what it's actually doing, you can be guaranteed that it's not of God. And if there's nobody around to understand it, then it's not of God. So we need to make sure that whatever we're doing, whatever we're participating in any way is of God. And, you know, Scripture tells us that all things of God are decent and in order. And so if that's not what's taking place either, either we ourselves are completely wrong because we're completely misunderstanding it, or what's happening is wrong. So we need to take everything back to God, back to his word at all times, and judge everything according to the written word of God. Let's pray. Our Father God, we thank you for being with us through this study. We thank you for enlightening these verses to us, for giving us a greater understanding of it. Um, for helping us to see what it is that you're trying to accomplish, what it is you're doing, and how that can affect us and, and, and what we should be able to, to learn from it. And, and that you are a God that gives understanding, not confusion. And so, Father, we pray that as we continue in, in our walk with you that or i should say in our life because sometimes we think we're walking with you when we're not but as we continue in our life that we will use the examples you've given us in scripture to to see what's happening in us and around us and compare it and see does this really meet with the word of god or not so father give us your wisdom give us your understanding and help us in all things, to submit ourselves unto you and let you work in us and through us and give us the understanding that you want for us to have. We pray these things in the holy name of Jesus and for your glory, O oh God. Amen. Amen. Amen.